Welcome to Total Pulse Sports. Coach Hutchings here, Coach Lambo. We had a very special guest today. We had the uh, public PA for just PA for the 49ers in San Francisco. Uh, Matt Crevin. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. How about you guys? Doing well. Thank you for joining Total Pulse Sports. Uh, Matt, go ahead and introduce yourself to Total Pulse Nation for us. You bet. Well, first of all, I want to say thanks for having me, and I'll, I'll do a quick introduction. As you already said, my name is Matt Crevin, and born and raised in the Bay Area. A couple of things of note in terms of I'm not going to read my whole profile to you and your listeners because that would induce sleepiness, but I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, you already mentioned it. Being the PA announcer um, for the 49ers, been doing this for 30 years running. It's a job that I absolutely love. It's a side job but it's one that I absolutely love. I've seen the ups and downs, uh, the ins and outs, and the behind the scenes action uh, of the NFL for the past 30 years. Maybe later I can share uh, with some of your audience how I got the job, because I think there's some lessons there. But I also have a, a career that I've run simultaneously, and that is I run my own small business. I am an entrepreneur, uh, and that is a business that uh, I work with high school students and deliver workshops and do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching on how to teach today's youth to communicate effectively. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, I'm sure we can go into a little more detail somewhere down the road here. Well, definitely. That is super important, too. Uh, you know, we're high school coaches and uh, kids these days, you know, we love them. But at the same time, you said the effective communication skills, that's a really tough thing for them right now. And pandemic definitely even brought that down even further. Um, so 30 years in San Francisco, that, that's pretty impressive. And you brought right in one of my next question is, uh, how did you get that job? What made you uh, go in that direction? Yeah, you know what? Uh, everyone's got a story how they got to where they are. Um, I wish there was some, you know, great story that I was overqualified. That was not it. I was actually not as qualified. I think it was just a personality mix, which there's some lessons there of just be human. You know, the term of, hey, just be yourself. It's it's so cliche, but just being human and, you know, observing the crowd, observing where you are and kind of play to that audience a little bit, but at the same time, be, be real. Uh, to me, I started out with the 49ers back in 1991. Uh, it seems like a long time ago, but it was. Um, side note, Joe Montana's last year was my first year. So that was kind of my my hallmark moment, if you will. But I started out as an unpaid public relations intern. That's a lot of people will break into the sports business as an unpaid intern, or maybe nowadays they're paid. But again, I think it was more of a personality. I could just, I walked into an NFL locker room with soon to be Hall of Fame athletes. I had to partner with members of the national broadcast media. Literally seven years earlier, I'm on my parents' couch watching all these people and admiring their work, both the athletes and the broadcasters. And now I'm in the same meetings with them. My head was spinning, but someone gave me a quick piece of advice and it always stuck. I said, look, if you're not the same guy that you were when you came in an interview, we will show you the door that you came in. It was code for, you've got to be, you've got to be a little more confident. You've got to talk to a lot of people here, a wide variety of personalities, uh, massive egos in, in all that. So that's how I started as an unpaid intern. Then I was hired full-time in 92, stayed on full-time in 93. And then right before the 94 season started, I was put to part-time, which of course I was crushed, was living that, you know, living the dream, as we all say, being in the front office of a sports franchise, but they offered me to stay on. And here I am, I'm in the middle or towards the end of my 30th season, the past 26 of those 30, I've done the PA work. So that's how I broke in. There's lots of stories about, you know, how that happened and how it worked. But again, it was just all about my ability to relax outside. I was nervous inside, but just to show them that I was real, I was human, and that I could talk to a wide variety of people. That was it. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's something that I've just done personally as well in terms of going into an interview. It's better to, to say exactly what you mean and to mean what you say and be in that moment uh, than to try to let somebody, you know, hear what they think you want them to say. And I think that's an incredibly important uh, aspect of all, you know, getting those jobs. Oh, man. I, I'm sorry. I just couldn't agree anymore because people go into interviews, whether they're, you know, interviewing with a, a minor league baseball team or uh, whatever it is, they're going in and they, and they go in as a fan. I said, look, you got to check your fan hat at the door. You're there to bring value to them in their, in the role, not because you're a fan of that team. And like you said, people go into an interview and they answer questions of the way they think they the person wants them to to hear it, opposed to just look, be real. It's going to come out at some point. Might as well lead with it. Yeah, uh, that's good. Uh, tell us some tips about uh, PA announcing, not the play by play, but just you know the basic tips. Yeah, I'm glad you, you differentiated that because there's a lot of people saying, "Oh, you're on the radio." Like, no, not on the radio. There's a big difference between play by play 
uh, being a color analyst versus PA work. There are some similarities. Obviously, you've got to know your stuff. You've got to know 53-man roster, two different teams. You've got to know their nuance of who's coming in. You know, if there's an H-back or an extra defensive back that's coming in, who's the fourth wide out that might come in. You have to know those tendencies just like anyone else. Because if that person makes a play, you got to know who they are and their name. And you have to enunciate it, enunciate it clearly and accurately. And you got to be fast. So there's those are the similarities. The differences to your question are I just I can kind of give it in pretty linear form. Um, I can't give, you know, so does that make sense? Meaning I'm just saying, hey, this is a, you know, Stephen Brown on the catch tackle made by someone else gained 14 yards on that play, bringing up a third and 15. Right. That's kind of a basic sequence, but I have, you know, you've got to be accurate, but I've learned a lot of lessons in there in terms of, you know, if your eyes are seeing one thing, it's okay to take a quick pause to make sure it's being, you're being accurate opposed to saying something and then have to make a correction. And trust me, I do it all over the course of a three and a half hour game. There's just mistakes that happen, but does that help and kind of uh, answer your question? Those are some similarities and some differences. I don't need, I don't give any, you know, color commentary to the play. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, I've coached high school for years and played uh, college football. There are a lot of PA uh, announcers at stadiums that need to listen to, to you, Matt. I mean, seriously, they talk way too much. They're plugging this, plugging that. And uh, I think just being just exactly like you said, making sure that you know who's on the field, you're announcing it clearly for everybody to, to hear so they can follow along. So especially, you know, you go to the bathroom, you go get drinks, you can hear, all right, it's first and 10, it's, it's second and eight. Um, you know, how about, you know, touchdowns? Are you the, the guy that's screaming out touchdown every time the 49ers score? So there's another, there's another differentiating. I did the stadium PA for a couple of years. Um, and I gotta be honest, I didn't like it. Here's why I didn't like it because it's just so, you know, sports has changed that way in terms of the entertainment value of it. Uh, and maybe it's just a little old school that way. Uh, they are just asking for something of me. And I wasn't that person. It kind of goes back to just being true to yourself, right? Whether it's an interview or the job you're doing, I couldn't just falsify and scream. And it brings up a third down, you know, the stuff you hear in, in arenas and stadiums everywhere. I said, man, I don't want to do that. There was an opportunity for me to go internal, still at the stadium, still announcing, but it fit me much better. And I made the transition to what's called the press box public address announcer. I'm still doing the same job but it's a lot more me. And here's what that means is I'm not, I don't have to yell and scream. I can give the same accurate. I'm still ready and prepared, but I give a lot more information. I give drive charts. I give injury updates. I give milestone updates. There's a lot more that I give. And to me, that is a lot more my style. Uh, so I kind of stepped away from the stadium piece of it to go internal. I'm still at the stadium. Everything else still applies. Just that, different delivery if, you, if that makes sense interesting um does that does that relate to the media people in the press box it relates to the members of the media both the home team the visiting team uh it relates to both staffs that are there uh whether ownership comes in they're there a lot too uh but my voice is piped into every possible luxury suite at levi stadium so I know it's going out there for those that are interested to hear and to turn it on and to listen. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, instead of, so yeah, it goes out and that's where, you know, in a way some journalism comes in. I don't need to yell and scream, but I'm given factual information. Yeah, I have a little voice inflection here or there. If something is exciting or if there's a good replay, I'm gonna make sure I bring a little voice to it, uh, but I'm not there to sizzle. I'm not there to create entertainment, if you will. I'm there to, to broadcast and I'm there to kind of bring some integrity to it instead of just yelling and screaming. So yeah, it's members of the media, it's VIPs, it's both teams, you know, ownership suite. So it's, it's a lot more than uh, people think, I guess, a lot of times. I bet you've been feeling really good this season the way the 49ers are and it's during that NFC West. Uh, you think, I think they're probably favorites to, to win out the NFC. You know, personally, I believe that. I'd love, I'd love that your personal opinion. I hope it comes true. Um, that, uh, but obviously, look, when anyone's doing, or when anyone's in any job and things go well on the job, it makes what you do a lot more fun. I mean, I think that's pretty basic and common sense. So I've seen the ups and downs. I've been through Super Bowl winning seasons. I've been through Super Bowl losing seasons. 
I think it'd be now's a great time to go back to another winning season. And I'm also in the midst of all that. There was almost a decade. It was just nine years of complete irrelevance uh, between Singletary and Mike Nolan and Chip Kelly and some other coaches. It was just almost a lost decade where the 49ers were absolutely just horrible. So I've kind of, you know, throughout 30 years, that's what you're going to get. You're going to see the ups and downs. But yeah, this year is fun. Um, who'd have thought after the way they started the first three weeks to be in a position to maybe even get a home playoff game. So yeah, it's exciting. It makes what I do a lot more fun. Yeah, that's uh, actually something too to, to transition just the life talk. Uh, that's a good way of putting it that the, you know, 30 years can be a lot of ups and downs. And uh, you know, when it's all good, it feels fantastic. You mentioned almost a decade there where, you know, you said insignificance almost and, you know, I'm sure doing the job is still an enjoyable job to have and you enjoy being there and, and doing all the games. But at the same time, you know, when you're seeing the team not performing as well, um, you know, it can leave a little mark on you. But I want to transition a little bit to, you said entrepreneur. Um, so you have a talk shop. Can you tell Pope Pole Nation about talk shop? Yeah, talk shop is my own entrepreneurial business. It's a small mission focused business. When I say that, it's just me. Um People like, you know, people that are interested to say, oh, you must have investors behind you or you must have business partners. Nope, just me. So scary and exhilarating all at the same time. In a nutshell, I developed Talk Shop because it's the culmination of a lot of the things that I've done professionally in my background, both in the sports business, in the corporate space, and also being a, a single dad of two teens. And that is I work with today's youth, high school students and college, but predominantly high school students. And I teach the lost art communicating effectively. And when I say the lost art, I'm talking about looking in eyes, having a conversation in real time, in person, networking, interviewing, resolving conflict, all of these things that are just human, they're going to happen. And I think there's a huge gap. And so Talk Shop is just a solution that kind of bridges that gap. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I, I could go on a little bit more, but I'll take a pause just to see if that makes sense. And for your listeners, maybe that was enough, or maybe I can go into more detail, let you guys decide. Yeah. So some of the things I was just thinking about is uh, you've worked with high school athletes. Um, what would you say to today's generation of high school athletes in terms of what they need to, in, ter in terms of the personal communication, talking to coaches, talking about like NIL deals and all that stuff um, on how to handle all this extra stuff going after a, a two year kind of lull in uh, with COVID where they were stuck at home and they're texting and tweeting and TikToking and everything like that. How could they work? I mean, besides obviously going to talk shop uh, to kind of learn some of those skills, um, but to really work on what they should focus on for moving ahead in the future. That yeah, it's a loaded question, but a completely fair and legit question at the same time. The easy answer is to say, look, research talk shop because I deliver group workshops that, that attack the very situation and scenario. That's the cheap answer. Let me give you a little real answer. And that is, uh, especially for student athletes, I was one too way back. Um, so I bring some knowledge into, you know, from the professional side, but also high school and college athletics. And I always say, look, did you guys, were you guys really experts at, at running the 22 cross power trap on the first day you showed up? No, take some practice, right? Um, communication skills take practice. If you don't, if you're showing up the same way online that you do in person, you're probably not going to get the job. You probably won't get that NIL deal. You probably aren't going to be in good graces with your coach. You can practice on showing up, meaning communicating, articulating your ideas, your vision, your thoughts, which are unique to you. You can do that clearly and confidently in a real-time conversation. Put the practice in now. Build those habits so that way they become skill for when the time matters. So I always just say, look, sometimes just wean yourself off of your phone. I'm not saying to ditch it. Not saying don't use it. Just saying pick a spot once or twice a week to start and have a conversation with your coach. FaceTime, even so you can see some body language, you can hear the tone. That's the first step. Is just you've got to put some different, you know, habits in place. It's behavior change. That's the first thing I would always say. Since you mentioned about you know behavior changes and not just that, but just the life the life lesson, and you mentioned the college level. Can you tell us about the transfer portal? Because, you know, there wasn't a transfer portal back in the day. And now all of a sudden we got all these guys transferring to four different schools in four years. Can you tell us about, you know, the mindset of why that's good and somewhat bad? <laughs> wow. Um, this might be getting out of my lane. So I want to be really transparent with that because, um, you know, I'm not 
my finger's not on the pulse of college athletics and the NC2A. I see both sides of it, probably just like you guys as high school coaches. Um, for those, there's, it, it provides great opportunity. And I think opportunity is all we could ask for as athletes or anyone that's in the business. It's just an opportunity to do your job and to do it in a place where you can make more of yourself, not just monetarily, but just make more of your life. But I also see the other side of the transfer portal where that's going to leave a lot of people out, meaning the schools that, you know, there's there's a lot to lose there too. So I see both sides of it. Um, I know that's not a clear cut answer, um, okay. but I, I also want to be really honest and open that I'm not as into detail with the transfer portal. This is just, you know, I'm speaking as a fan at this point, not from any insider scoop is again, just kind of summarize. I think it's great because it creates a lot of opportunity. Basically, it's like free agency in the NFL. It's creating a lot of different opportunities for these young students to go somewhere where maybe they get another, you know, get another NIL deal or get something that's going to fit them. But the smaller schools, I think, are going to lose out. And I think for that, I'm not really a big fan of that either. I agree. Sorry, I totally evaded that question. That's how's that? It's <laughs> all good. So I kind of want to bring it back to just the communication aspect. Um, just in general, you know, I taught uh, virtually over COVID. Um, and I had, I was just sitting, I had screens available and I had 30 kids on, it was Google Meet at the time and I just switched to Zoom now. Um, but I noticed differences in age groups and my sixth graders could never stop talking. They're talking to one another the whole time. Then you get to eighth grade and eighth grade looks, you, you saw this from the kids. They just did not want to show themselves. They did not want to uh, communicate. They didn't want to engage anybody around them. And same thing I kind of see in the high school level now. Um, you know, there's kids that still wear masks and I don't judge the mask, but some of them I think are using it to kind of, again, do that, that hiding of themselves um, so that you, you just see their eyes and they really don't have to communicate uh, as well. And just, you know, we definitely want to, uh, you know, talk about talk shop, but if you could say like three things besides, you know, you already mentioned one about, um, you know, taking some time to practice. Uh, the three things that maybe are two things, even just one thing that uh, a student or a student athlete could do almost immediately um, besides putting the phone down that would automatically kind of improve their communication skills. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, you're right. You know, stepping away from technology, meaning just, I already mentioned it, but I'll start with it again and I'll maybe come up with some new additional advice as well. But again, just you know, if these people, there, there's a, there's a lot of, I don't want to say addiction. That's a really strong word. So that's probably not the right way to say it, but there's a huge attraction to just have the phones and devices. They're almost stitched to us. Right. So picking a spot to once or twice a week, uh, go to a neighbor, go to a coach, go to a tutor, go somewhere where you can just talk with someone. And I always say, look, keep it simple. 60 seconds, one minute, pitch yourself. Oh, well, what do I do? What do I say? Pitch yourself. Tell people your name, what grade you are. You lost connection. We'll be right back. Just finding a spot to. Yeah, I think pitching yourself. You know, it's just one simple way. Uh, because look, it's real. It, it's kind of interview prep in a way. But just have some of your students come to you. You know, uh, if that's it, or to a parent, or to someone else that they, you know, that's in their inner circle, and just. 60 seconds worth. Give him your first and last name. Hey, my name is Jonathan Smith. I'm currently a junior at, uh, you know, Southwest High School, and I play on the volleyball team. And last summer, I worked at a summer camp. This summer, I'm looking to, you know, do something a little different. That's a quick pitch. That's just an easy thing just to get used to, get comfortable. Um, I think that's one. Even, you know, as basic as it sounds, if someone's going to order in food, uh, if it's a family going to order a pizza, or if a student has to, uh, a doctor's appointment, a parent or whatever that family sphere looks like, have the student, have the young adult make the phone call. It's amazing. Some people that get paralyzed like by making a phone call. Well, I don't know what to say. Tell them your name. I'd like to schedule an appointment. Tell them your name. I'd like to order a large pizza. Get into real conversations where you get to talk and then listen to someone else. That's the natural ebb and flow of a conversation. So it's just, you know, little, I mean, as basic as that sounds, I don't know if you got that was almost maybe too basic, but I'll stop for a second to see if that even makes sense to you guys. I identify with that big time. When I was a teenager, I absolutely hated calling the doctor, hated calling to order food. Um, I just didn't want it because I was worried, you know, it was kind of a nonsensical worry about worried about what the other person, how they were going to talk, 
what's I going to be able to understand them? Um, but you're right, without that practice, you, you never will know if you can understand those people. Uh, from, you know, all different backgrounds, whatever it may be, you know, the doctor's office speaks one way, the pizza order place that, you know, um, the Chinese food place I order from, and they're so direct, like, what do you want right there? And, you know, it's like, and it's just different dynamics right. each, each conversation that you're having. But that's real life. And I think that's just one technique. That's just one piece of advice. I want to get back to something you said, though, if you don't mind, is, you know, you said when you were teaching over Zoom, some of the sixth graders were talking all over each other. The eighth graders were kind of hiding their face. You know, you're going to get all that stuff. That is just, you know, maybe that's just a maturity situation where people just kind of evolve. But, uh, and this isn't mine. This is just research that's out there because I do this for a living. There's there's research out there as late as just a year ago um, that, you know, because of technology, and I'm not super anti-technology, that's not it, but it's definitely caused the gap. It's part of it because there's a huge avoidance. People use their phones to avoid having a real interaction, calling the Chinese restaurant, calling the pizza order, making your own doctor's appointment. There's lack of practical experience, which creates this huge gap in the ability to communicate. So I thought I would toss that out there. No, I, I agree with you. And then as you know, I, I do a, a, about me uh, for all my students at the start of the year, a little PowerPoint slideshow so I can get to understand them better, understand their background. We have students from all across the world students from all across the county and state with different ideas, you know, um, one parent, two parents, grandma raised them, something like that. But the one thing that happens a lot um, in the years I've done it is I say, tell me, tell me something that you want to tell Coach Hutchings, you know, kind of that he knows about you uh, just in your personal experience. And the thing that pops up most often is I don't do well in group presentations and I do not do well presenting to the class. And I think it just brings back to what you're talking about is you don't have enough experience in doing that, putting yourself in that situation where it becomes a natural thing to just stand up in front of the class and just read that one page report about whatever history or, or science or whatever you might be doing. Um, I think, yeah, and you're right with just the way technology has been that kids are, are, are kind of glued to it. We're glued to it as adults. I mean, we went to the uh, commander's game the other day and, you know, everybody's got their phones out either filming or they're texting or they're looking up news. And we had kids in front of us, uh, like pretty much gaming the entire time on their phones. Um, so it's, it's out there. But again, that's the thing that I see a lot is, you know, I don't, Mr. Hutchings, I don't want to uh, stand in front of the class and, and talk to the class about anything. Um, right. So you know, I really don't make them do it that much, but I will engage them in the conversation. Say, I'm going to call on every single one of you throughout this you know, week of the school year. And you're going to have to answer something in more than just a yes or a no or an I don't know. You know, uh, my, my six or five year old niece, her her new thing is shrugging her shoulders and saying, I don't know. So it's pretty basic. And, and, I, and I'll ask a question in a way and make a statement at the same time. You guys are both coaches. And, and I know that dynamic is when I was a high school student, you know, the coach is pretty, you know, um, it's a pretty powerful figure when you're that when you're a high school kid. I'm not saying you're physically imposing, but, you know, when you're a coach it might be difficult for them. Although at the same time, there might be some comfort level there. Uh, locker room dynamics um, are always interesting. Hopefully it's a comfort zone that the coaches create for these kids. And, and the good news is, and the way I look at it is most athletes, both you know, young men and young women, uh, not only are they going to share that competitive drive, but they're going to have that just that instinct to practice, 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 because that's what they do to get game ready. So that's already there. It's just a twist of, you know what, we're not going to practice, you know, you know, this blocking technique. We're going to practice this. It's some, and sometimes it's, oh man, come on. I'm an athlete. I, I know how to do this. I'm too cool for that. It's interesting. I see it all. Uh, when I, especially, you know, cause working with student athletes is a sweet spot for me because anytime you were an athlete, you can speak, you know, speak to them because you were in that chair. So I hope that makes sense um, in a way that, you know, there's a good thing there that student athletes are used to, you know, practicing something, you need to get them to practice something different. No, I agree. And that's, um, I've done some things in my career that have been, you know, I learned it from uh, just watching you know, comedians, but like improv, where you're, you're just talking to anybody and creating these scenarios. And just, I think of just an additional way to practice is just the, the yes and drill where you make a statement, it could be ludicrous, it could be right, you know, just a regular statement, say yes, and you agree, and you just move on to the next thing. And it, it's one gets the creative mind going, but two gets that, that feedback back and forth. Um, I think would be something that, I mean, I mean, I would try to get back and break from my students just to, to see what they can 
Well, I love that you brought up comedy. I'm not a comic, but I love good humor. Sometimes it's not the right time. Sometimes it'll be, you know, ill-placed, but I'll just share this because there is a small correlation and work with me on this one. You guys might agree or disagree, but there's kind of three basic rules of being a good comic is know your audience, have good timing, and then delivery. When you're presenting in front of a group or one-on-one, -on -one, you got to know who your audience is. You have to have good timing and then deliver your content. Do it. Do it. If you're a comedian, you you know, obviously you have tone and inflection to make your punchline stand out. It's the same thing. If you're sharing your ideas or sharing the value you can bring to working at the grocery store and you're interviewing, make something stand out. Use your voice. So there is some correlation between being a good comic and being a good being someone that can communicate effectively. I know some people might see that as a stretch, uh, but I bring that up in my group workshops all the time. Those three key pieces. It's huge. And then. From there, it's learn how to become clear and concise. So once you put those two into place, then you become more just naturally confident. I agree. Tell us, tell us what you learned from all these years of just, you know, being around the student athletes. And I know you learned something each and every year. So tell us what you learned based, based, based off your experiences. That no one starts out as an expert in anything. When I was in high school, I thought I was great. I think a lot of people fall into that trap. You think you're really good and... Then you get outside of your own little community and you're like, oh man, that, that dude's a pretty good athlete. I'm getting worked over here pretty good. You know, you just, no one starts out as, you know, as an expert in anything. That's the first thing that I've, that I've learned. Um, the second thing is, you know, and I've learned this the hard way, is that being an effective communicator is not just being able to speak. It's learning how to listen. Hmm. Listening is, you know, a critical element that I still work on. Um, Listening is paramount in becoming a good communicator, asking for clarity, asking questions, because if you don't, you're going to be, it's going to be assumed that you'll know what someone's trying to teach you, whether it's a coach or you're in class. Those two things, I think, uh, are the biggest lessons. There's a lot more. But the first thing, again, just to kind of add to it is no one starts out as an expert in anything is goes back to take some practice. doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a first chair violinist or you're the starting left tackle takes practice to become really good at it and then the listening so i just wanted to kind of summarize those are the two big things that that i've learned over the years and that goes with you know in the sports business you know i'm on headset during my games i've got a nfl sanctioned if you will an official statistician in my ear i've got to listen first before i can make an announcement and i'm sometimes i'm talking and i have to listen to someone in my ear so there's some you know nuances to listening and i thought I'd, I, I can't accentuate that enough. It's just, it's, it's valuable. Yeah. And I a hundred percent agree too. I mean, that's gotta be like, I just imagine myself in your shoes when I, I walked in, coach uh, Lambo was watching some videos and he was trying to talk to me and I could not listen to what he was saying because of the videos and they weren't loud. It's just kind of the way my, I've been to too many concerts, honestly, too many sporting events, but um, that's just kind of like the way my listening works. I can't have any of those extra things. So if I had somebody in my ear while I'm trying to deliver something, I think I would just be all befuddled. So I think just going back to you done it, you know, now you really said announce it or the PA for what, 27 years, 26 years, um, a lot of practice. I mean, how many hours would you say that you've actually done this job? I mean, it's got to be in the tens, oh. hundreds of hours. That? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I've never broken it down by the hours. Of, uh, I think at some point I took a note of, for the fun of it, over 30 years, how many Monday night football games I've announced? How many playoff games have I announced? How many NFC championships have I announced? I haven't done it by hour, but if you think about it, every game is typically around three and a half-ish, give or take. Over 30 years worth of games. Some seasons have just been eight because there's been no postseason. Some have been, you know, 10 or 11 games. So um, a lot of hours. That's all I can say. I don't have a distinct number, uh, but... Uh, a lot of hours, but at that point, um, I always walk into any game. If I don't feel a little bit of nerves, that those good butterflies, then it's time for me to step away from the mic. Uh, I still feel that way because I want to do a good job. And it's, you know, if you're a junior in high school and you got to stand up in your lit class and give a little book project for four minutes, it seems like an eternity, right? It's a long time. Think about doing something on you know, a live unscripted event for three and a half hours. But I started at the four-minute mark, too. I didn't start out as an expert. I've made plenty of mistakes. I still do. I just try to minimize them.
So in your 30 year uh, tenure, you've met tons of people, I'm sure uh, you've been locked into the games, but in your experience, uh, what coach, owner, player, or otherwise has been one of the best or more effective communicators that you've met or worked with? Boy, that's a great question. And uh, I've been asked almost uh, what I thought was almost every question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. So uh, give that man a raise. Good question. Let me think about that. Uh, let me, uh, the first is as an athlete, um, one of the first jobs I had when I was an intern is I would go into the post game locker room, which can be either really, really great or extremely, extremely challenging, depending on win or loss. Um, I would always go to offensive linemen and it was just, they, they were willing to speak. They were articulate. Uh, they were smart and they didn't get a lot of pub publicity. So they were always willing. Um, Harris Barton jumps out. He's a former Niner. Uh, there's been guys on other teams that I've talked to as well. Sometimes those offensive and defensive linemen are just, for whatever reason, just really good at wanting to talk and sharing their ideas. Um, that's on the athlete side because I had to go down and do some post-game interviews and get immediate post-game quotes. From a broadcast, um, I think Dick Enberg uh, jumps out. I was you know, privileged to get to work with him once. It was 1993 in the booth with him and Bob Trumpy for NFL enthusiasts. Those guys were the hallmark for many, many years. Um, he was just a consummate pro. He told me exactly his style. He, uh, he told me exactly what his expectations of me, because uh, that first year I worked in the TV booth with a lot of crews that would come in. Extremely nerve wracking to be able to provide them information as they're going through their broadcast. It's what's called being a spotter. You guys familiar with that at all or, so yeah. that to me, that to me was pretty intense, but Dick Enberg was just super calm, super professional. Hey, Matt, this is what we're after. This is what we need from you. Um, and then there was another one that jumped out um, and his name was Jack Snow. He was a former all, all pro. I think he was a wide out with Notre Dame. His son was JT Snow, who played for the San Francisco Giants for years. Jack Snow was the color analyst for Rams radio for years because he went on to be a Ram in his pro days. He, uh, I walked into the booth, told him I was their spotter, and he looked at me and said, you any good? Like, just really gruff and just rough, and he was just testing me out. And I said, how good do you want me to be? I mean, I deferred to humor, right? Kind of going back to it, thinking, hey, is this going to fly? It's the first thing I could think of. And he said, I like it. Come on in. Um, different styles, right? Everyone comes to the table with a different communication style. So... Those are just some quick gut reactions. There's been plenty of people that have been uh, really, really good. But I think I, like many, learned from people that maybe could do things better because it you 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 observe it and you file that away. It's like, I, I want to do, I could do that, but I could do it differently. So I've learned a lot over the years from people that, um, you know, sometimes just learn by doing and from other conversations you have with people that you feel, hey, I could do that a little bit better than that person. And that sounds a little egotistical, but I don't mean it that way. You just learn, you watch, you observe. And what could you do differently to do that job better? So no, that, that hit, I hope, that, hits I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And that hits home too, just from the athlete standpoint, I played defensive offensive line and just throughout my career, seeing names up on boards and seeing the way people played, I was like, I want to do that. I can do that. I can be better than that. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, ego standpoint. I think it's just ability standpoint you know if somebody else can do it they're I always say to my students they breathe the same air they drink the same water they eat the same food what makes them different than you you know it comes down a lot to attitude and work ethic you know what you're what you're willing to put in yeah I couldn't agree more and it I don't I, maybe there's nothing I could really add to that other than you know when I was a younger you know younger puppy coming into this business you know I, I mentioned earlier you know having to walk into a room with Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, Steve Young, all these guys that were, you know, soon to be Hall of Fame athletes. I was nervous as you know what. I just was. I mean, it was human. I was being natural. I was nervous. I was scared about the experience and the situation I was in until someone pulled me aside and said, look, we can see you're nervous. Just know they get dressed just like you do. It was exactly what you just said, you know, and, but it's hard initially when you're awestruck, whether it's a movie star or personality of, of any type of fame, yeah, it's hard to gut check yourself and say, look, you know what? They brush their teeth just like we do, hopefully. And yeah, so you mentioned uh, Dick Ember. Uh, do you have any other mentors that uh, you can mention that you've worked with or, or just even just uh, viewed or followed and that they've made an impact on you? 
Oh, yeah. And you'll see my head spin around. You can't see it on camera, but uh, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of radio crews, a lot of TV crews, observed a lot of visiting teams, PR staff. Their job is to, you know, publicly relate, right, to a wide variety of people. I'm looking around. Um, one that always jumps out, uh, and, and I don't know if your viewers on the East Coast uh, would know this name. He's since passed away, but his name is Bill King. In my mind, probably the best radio announcer of all time. He did three major sports, and he did them all at an extremely high level. Uh, he did the Golden State Warriors for basketball, the Oakland Raiders at the time for football, and he went on to do the Oakland A's. So he's a Bay Area icon, so may not be known somewhere else. But the opportunity to ride a press elevator with him and just have a conversation with him, to meet him on the sidelines before a game. This is a guy that I literally was in my dad's car as a kid listening to. He painted a picture. He was an artist. He really was. And it, so it was just so informative for me to grow up and listen to someone that was so good on the radio where you really have to create a vision for someone because they're listening to it and they're not seeing it. I took a lot from that. I can't emulate that in the PA work that I do, but I definitely take it into the workshops that I deliver of painting a picture of why something matters, why should being able to communicate effectively matter to you. So Bill King is the, is the one that I would say I, I listened to and absorbed a lot. I didn't want to be like him because I couldn't, but I could learn from him. Is it storytelling? Absolutely. In a way, Everything is storytelling. Um, you guys are probably familiar with TEDx talks. Maybe your students may not be as familiar. That's a huge platform to share a story. You know, share your ideas. Is that idea worth sharing? And I always say, look, you know, I'm not a TEDx forum, but teaching these students that it's important because no one can share your story any better than you can yourself. And it's all about can you tell a good story? And does someone want to read more about your story? That's how you know you're a good storyteller. I, I agree. And I think that brings us, uh, go ahead and tell your story about Talk Shop, um, how people can find you and, and communicate with you and, and see, you say you had group workshops and things and, you know, let, let Tonable Nation know about, you've already given us some really good insight in a lot of different areas. Um, but yeah, how can people find you and, um, you know, what, what you can offer them? Yeah, first I'll tell people uh, how to find me. And it's just the website is it's the easiest because then all the social media and my email is all right there. It's a unique website by the name of it, it's talkshop.company. So it's talkshop.company. And all my information is there. If anyone wants to reach out, I'm always happy to set a time just to chat. Um, what people can learn or what the workshops are about and who they're geared for, they're for high school students and for college students. The high school program is really kind of the core concepts of um, how do you communicate online and how do you communicate in person, the do's and don'ts of social media? How do you pitch and present yourself? How do you apply the three C's, that clear, concise, and confident, and why it matters? How do you listen and how listening is important? Those are kind of at the core, but the workshops are not a lecture. I always like to let people know these are very collaborative. It's like coaching. You're going to step someone through you know, a blocking technique and you show them by doing it. My workshops are very collaborative where the students are actually going to do a lot of the learning. Uh, they're going to collaborate rather, and that's where the learning comes from. So they're not going to sit into a lecture where they just sit and listen very interactive. They run 60 to 70 minutes and it's amazing. You snap your finger and it's gone, but they walk away with some immediately usable tools that they can use in the very next conversation, meaning the minute they end the workshop. I wish I could force them to do that, but they're ready to do it. They have to put themselves into it at that point. So that those are some of the key learning outcomes. The college workshop is a little more career oriented. How do you pitch and present? How do you create your own brand? And as you mentioned, how do you share your story? So th that's kind of the two differences between the two workshops, both very interactive, both very collaborative. Uh, it's a skill that's needed now more than ever. You guys can see it too, just with working with, you know, young adults and students. And again, the website is talkshop.company. If anyone wants to reach out and learn more, I'm happy to set a time to chat with anyone. Is, is communicating branding? In part, Absolutely. I always love this analogy. Uh, what's your? Uh, do you have a go-to cereal when you go to the market? Uh, not really. <laughs> I don't eat. Do you have a go-to when you go to the market? Do you have a go-to brand <laughs> for deodorant? Do you have a go-to brand for bread? It's something just very typical that you see. Okay, so wipes. 
So yeah, product placement, right? On that shelf where there's disposable wipes like that, how many how many competing products do you think there are? Just ballpark it. Probably like three, four, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And so you think of other products and it's like, well, there's a reason why you buy that one versus another. And it's a brand. It could be who's marketing it, who's endorsing it. Something about that is capturing your attention, right? It's the same with us as humans. And yes, it's a big part about how do you brand yourself? And I always tell the students, become your own CMO. And for those that don't know what that acronym is, it's be own chief marketing officer. Put out and protect your brand because no one else is going to do it for you. And no one else is going to do it better than you can do it yourself. So branding, that's all about sharing your story, being clear and concise when you communicate with someone. It all backs up to what do you want your brand to be? No, very well said. And I think that that little tip, uh, flip right there, I think we're going to throw that into one of our shorts because that is one of the best things that we could tell our uh, student athletes for sure. I mean, they are going to be their best marketer and you can't expect anybody else to do it for you. Totally agree. Absolutely. And so Matt Krevin, we really appreciate you stopping by Totem Pole. Um, Totem Pole Nation, definitely go to talkshop.company and check out uh, his work. And uh, reach out. You know, there's there's a ton, especially uh, high school athletes. If you're out there, you know, it's a great place. You know, we've learned a lot just today. I think it's a great spot to go work on these things that, you know, as a former college athlete and hopefully, you know, was trying to go pro, these things that you had to work on. I think, Matt, you do an excellent job of uh, being clear and concise and, and confident. Well, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys having me on. All right. Lynn, we're going to close it out. Today's video is sponsored by Dude Wipes. It's the best product in America. 35% larger, 99% water, and it's fragrance free. Please wipe your rear ends. <laughs> All right. Well, Matt Krevin, thank you again. Appreciate it. Total Pool Nation. Check out talkshop.company. Please like, share, subscribe, and we will see you later.